give and have given now for over a decade really about fixing climate and hunger and water um, to one that will go into why it looks like we're not doing it. Um, so it's going to be a little bit different. But I start off here with a, a little bit different beginning, I'm standing in the U.S. and flying a French flag. So, you know, I actually fly that on my home for a very specific reason. I want it to create conversation. Um, and I fly it for three primary reasons. You know, one is, I, obviously by my name, I have some French heritage. Uh, two is that um, this country wouldn't be a country without the French coming to help us defeat the British at Yorktown. Um, and so it always uh, made me feel a little bit curious that during that time of uh, one of our administrations that wanted us to stop calling them French fries, that we should call them freedom fries. <laughs> I didn't even take offense. I said, that's right, freedom fries. And they helped us with freedom. And then um, the thing that I really would want to take it to is, is that the French have launched this discussion of four per thousand. And how do we increase our soil carbon to 0.4% on all of our land? And with that, we'd fix climate change. And so they were a country that led this discussion. And there have been over 30 countries sign on to this idea. Uh, it's not surprising that this country is not one of them. But anyway, it's um, an encouraging thought that a country recognized what we could actually do from that standpoint. So where I am going to uh, risk today, oh, that was funny that it jumped. Okay, there we are. Is that we are on a known trajectory, which I want to talk about, um, of where we're headed as a species and where we're taking the planet. And we have the science and the data in the background and the history to show us where that is. We also know that we have solutions that can really avert extinction. Yeah, we have to use that word because that really is a trajectory that we're on. And then I'm going to offer some thought processes in, the, in why, as humans, we're actually not taking hold and doing something about this uh, because it's more than imminent uh, as if we, when we look at the scientific data. So in, in essence, let me see why I have to stand back here to get it to work. We could put up so many statistics, so much science, so much data to support our trajectory on uh, basically extinction and, and destroying the ecosystems that support life. And these are just a few of those discussion points. And we're doing this at sometimes increased rapidity, not slowing it down or reducing our impact on other species and on our ecological systems that support the living system here for us and for them as well. This world scientist warning to humanity is a second notice. And it just came out as odd because in 92, uh, at the gathering in Rio, that was sort of the first notice. Hey, we're on a trajectory of extinction and we're extincting all of our co-living brothers and sisters on this planet, from trees to, to insects to uh, water species, on and on it goes. Well, the trajectory remains. And they've just come out with a second notice. I don't know what happens when the third notice comes, but uh, we seem to be uh, not being able to slow that process down. And here it went backwards when I'm pushing forward. Let's see what's, if I'm doing something wrong or we're just having communication difficulties up here. So there are two events um, that are going to apply the largest pressure on us. And David Montgomery talked about this event uh, yesterday when he talked about the level of erosion uh, that's occurring and what brought forward his first book. But it's not just erosion, it's degradation. So there's two ways to look at this, 60 years, or some people are talking about 60 harvests are left. So for some of the young people in here, this directly affects uh, a thought process is towards your future. And how do we turn this one around? Uh, so we talk about a lot of things, but, but soil is typically not one of the things that uh, hits the headlines. So this one did hit the headlines once, uh, I think. I'm not sure it's ever been really readdressed in the general media. And there is, of course, from a geological perspective, a thought that we can only build soil sometimes in thousands of years to any degree. And so 
we are putting ourselves at deep risk with regard to that. I borrowed these two slides from Ray Archuleta, and, and Ray uh, has, he put the video on yesterday, if you watched his presentation of the, the erosion that's occurring, this was wind erosion. And so, in 1935, we started, you know, our soils program for conservation. So what did we learn? We, Dr. Richard Teague has just been talking about the fact that we now are losing three tons of topsoil for every ton of corn or soybeans we produce. Does that fit into any realm of discussions of sustainability? And it certainly doesn't talk about regeneration. So we have knowledge, we've studied this, we have put government programs forward, we have university degrees in education, and we kind of know this, but the trend remains the same. We haven't changed our behavior as humans in these processes. So he showed the, a, a video film of, of something in, in Arizona that was going on with regard to these dust storms. A dear friend of mine, Roland Bunch, had, uh, it was the first guy who showed me, person who had shown me that you could build systems very rapidly. And really, I've made him start to use the term regeneration because it's now become a term we're promoting to think in terms of how you build systems rapidly. But he made a statement and published it in 2011, uh, basically that Africa's soil fertility crisis is in the coming famine. And he did that from, and published it in the State of the World 2011. The tragedy is rushing at us so quickly that tens of millions of people could starve within the next four or five years. The continent faces an imminent tra tragedy, a great African famine, and it won't end the next time it rains. Roland would say, I'm not a meteorologist and I'm not a climatologist, and I can't talk about climate change. And he would say and offer, how could I make that prediction? He did admit he was two months off. Because we did, and in America we don't follow these stories well, we did meet that famine, and there were 10 to 20 million people affected by it in Western Africa. He will say it isn't the amount of rain that comes either. But what happens is it comes back to the soil degradation piece that we have knowledge around, but we're not acting on. So in that part of Africa, what happened, of course, is as the populations rose, the land sizes shrunk, and their ability to actually then set land aside and fallow was eliminated. And what did the fallow do? The fallow gave the opportunity and the chance for soil organic carbon to be replenished and therefore water holding capacity and percolation. So he said people would come and ask him, how is it we can have a flood and a drought in the same year? Well, what is that phenomena? If you go to many of those soils in Western Africa and they're kind of sandy and you think, well, sand, the water will go right in. No. It doesn't. It caps like all soil. And if it's been tilled, it caps much faster. And if there's no open spaces and pores, the water doesn't percolate. So you get a downpour. It'll go about that deep in the soil. The rest runs off and goes down in the washes in the stream. So you have a flash flood. And a few hours after the rain, you're back to dry. So you have a drought and flood all in the same year. It's all because of the soil. And that's why he predicted it, and that's why he said the next rains will not fix it. Because the soil has been degraded like that statement, we have 60 harvests left. And we're doing this globally, of course, without having this consciousness about, wait, we know how to build this back, but we're not moving into that framing. So, in essence, I swear, I know I've skipped uh, some pictures there. I think I'm going to use this. Sorry about that one. So here's a, here's a point that's called, uh, that's in Ghana, and this is to kind of uh, exemplify the discussion we were just having. And that is that you see, this is Kofi Boa that, that uh, David Montgomery had talked about yesterday. And I was helping him in Ghana set up some experimental plots in four different ecoregions with different rainfalls, different soil types, etc. And the front plot is cowpeas, 
that was tilled in the normal manner. So this is just a tillage question. And this is what we have a history of teaching and practicing in agriculture is tillage. Uh, and so this was a failure when the second season rains didn't come in their normal level. The top uh, block up there is also cowpeas that for one season was not tilled. And that's the only difference in the treatments of those two plots. No compost, no fertilizers, no extra water, just not tillage. And so we see, in essence, our mindset about tillage of where it can really damage food security. And there are, uh, I mean, we have such a long history as David was talking yesterday, you know, one of the most dramatic um, deleterious inventions that we created was the plow and I'm beginning to believe that we should plow and till. In uh, the farming system trial at Rodale, and I was there for three years, and one of the things that, that I couldn't seem to get was a shift in the idea of tillage. So even though there's a discussion of no-till because they plant with roller crippers and direct seeding, at the end of the season they plow. Well, there's been no difference in carbon in 30 years. So it has not increased. And you can continue to get erosion in those systems as well. It will stay in that arrangement. Now, I know I have list, missed a whole bunch of slides in here. Let's just do this one. Here's one that we can't uh, afford to miss. So when we go the erosion, uh, with, to use the term that David Montgomery used, the erosion of civilization, um, I'll just start on the left. This was the field next to my research plots and my demonstration site in Africa that Howard Buffett set up for me. He said, Tim, I'm going to provide you with the best, worst soils that we can find. And so this was part of it. And you see, it was just sand. In the field right next door, I actually said to the farm crew, I said, do you mind coming out and just disking it one time? Because the weeds are starting to go to seed, and they're going to all blow towards my research uh, plots. And I just not don't want to fight all of that. I felt very badly after one rain event came through, and this is, was the result. One disking. There wasn't a deep plowing. It was a light disking. I did some work in Burundi and worked with some of the government leaders there to think in terms of, here's a, a country, fourth poorest country in the world, that is 90% agrarian, and they till every inch of them. Your future, it's your today. Well, the bottom right is my neighbor in, in uh, California, Central Coast of California, and I'll tell you, there are so many fields that have been disked and ready for the rains to come. So they, they will plant their grains and they will wait for the rains to bring them up. All we need is those heavy rains that Elaine was just talking about, you know, and some big runs, and that field ended up on the, on the highway. And what happened to that soil? It wasn't scooped up and taken back to the field. It was scooped up and hauled away. So the topsoil continues to disappear. So David was talking to us about this. Uh, the reason I have this airplane shot up here is that Doug Tompkins invited me down to Argentina because Doug had worked very hard in his life to try and preserve land. And, and to, you know, he and his wife uh, donated huge tracts of land to Argentina and uh, Chile for national parks, trying to preserve wildlife and, and open space. But he also had a 6,000 acre organic farm. And he was at really taking on the challenge of how do we turn this organic farm into no-till? Because he saw every day how much soil was being lost. So he understood organic was missing that discussion point and how clearly deeply needed it was. And so in essence, he would fly me down along the farm and every farm he'd go, look, 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 every farm was washing into the Paraná River. And he, because he would fly between places all the time, he saw this every day. And he knew we had to change our practices. So it's a challenge for us in the organic world to begin to move into those uh, areas of figuring out how we do our weed suppression and control, and yet, and, and stop tilling, and yet get our yields and productivities. Which is what I did have the advantage and opportunity to do in Africa, was to figure that system out, but it doesn't mean it's easy. And it does mean it takes some serious management to, to accomplish that. <clears throat> That's where this slide does come in appropriately. So in my field where I share where that erosion, that very sandy soil was, what occurred is that 
When we were teaching a group of, of seed growers across the continent of Africa that were brought into our, our research facility in South Africa, we had one, three of us did it, and one of the South Africans that we brought in to teach said, Tim, bring me a soil uh, clod from your field. He said, I, I want to do an aggregation test. And I thought, are you kidding me? That is sand. And he didn't, he'd never even tested it. But he knew how I was farming. I was farming, and I created a scenario where I limited myself to no outside inputs. So I had sand that was phosphorus deficient, and I limited myself to only purchasing seed, and that was all, because I was trying to work with the smallholder farmers that didn't have resources anyway. And since, you know, us arrogant organic people, we can just do this, right? Um, surprisingly, after the first season, it all worked. It worked exceptionally well, and I could go into those details if you're interested. But I didn't think the sand was going to stick together, for sure. So this is, when we dropped it in, this is the, the sample that there was, when, when he set that in there, I was so shocked that it was in good aggregation that I had to start to ask myself, what the hell is really going on with this soil? And I'll, I'll talk about that just quickly here. This was that field that I said I dissed just once, right? It's same pivot, but it was right next to my fields. So it had completely just dissolved immediately. On my home place in California, um, this sample, it's the same thing. The reason it's dark colored is I didn't get to take a picture of it until 10 days later. So it's kind of sitting there. But look at it's, the integrity of that soil is still there. And this was the farmer right across the, the street from me who disks twice a year that just completely dissolved. And so the soil aggregation piece, when we talk about loss of soil, is crucial and critical. And Ray Archuleta has been one of the greatest uh, missionaries on this point about how we hold soil in place and how we get that aggregation. One of the things we know, and our soil biologists are teach, have been teaching us, that the mycorrhizal fungi will uh, really emit those glues and start to create aggregation and hold soil in place. It's odd in my sand in Africa because the fields that I took over uh, hadn't been farmed in a year, but before that they'd been farmed heavily dissed, heavily plowed, heavily chemicalized, and it was sandy, and yet biology still lived within it. And it was able to be regenerated and restored when you kept the chemicals out, stopped disking, plowing, and tilling, and then I put it in a simple rotation system. And one of the things that occurred is in Africa, they say now, you cannot fallow because there's not enough land left. You have to farm it every year. Well, just to be a little stubborn, I thought, well, I'm gonna grow a Lab Lab bean uh, a year before I'm going to rotate my maize into it, and I'm just going to knock it down. And I could have hung on and harvested it a while and knocked it down, but I just knocked it down. The next year, I moved it in. By the time the next season came along, you couldn't even see there had been any crop in there because it had, through a dry winter and all that, just disappeared. The high enough nitrogen in that leaf matter with the carbon let it break down fast. But in that one year, was able to move that maize from showing some phosphorus deficiency, to being five times the yield of any neighboring smallholder farmer. And if you can jump at five times the yield, it looks like you could afford to fallow, doesn't it? Just in the strip. A five times increase really gives you a huge advantage. It would give them food security, it would give them money for school fees and extra money as well. So it's the kind of thing that could be done. Eventually came with Kofi Boa into a framing of saying, no, actually, we can grow all of that biomass below the corn during the same season, and we don't even have to do the fallow anyway. But it is a way to say investing back in that soil with roots, as our biologists have been telling us, you know, with leaving the biomass there and with not disturbing the soil can make a tremendous difference. So that brings me to the point of saying so soil loss, soil degradation, means we are on this trajectory of not being able to survive a civilization or even as a species. The next thing, of course, is climate change. We're on the same trajectory. Only problematically, scientists are telling us we really have 10 years, not 50, not 60, to level this thing off right now and begin the decline. And that's all the time we have. Actually, there's news even worse than that because some say it's three. 
So what are we doing about it? There is no, absolutely no historical, and this, with all due respect to Bill McKibben, there is no historical data here that says we can live at 350 there, and we know we're over 400 now. We have no evidence that 350 is a goal, a good goal, and that's what the Paris Accord's working towards. That's what people talking in the climate change world are working towards is the 350, and we're not headed there. But I would argue we need to go back to pre-industrial levels. That's really our only option to stabilize climate so that we are going to be able to grow our crops. I'll tell you, in Africa, every, didn't matter which country they came from to our training sessions, I'd always start my presentations with them by saying, tell me, where are you from? How's your weather? Scientists told us Africa would be affected first. And it has been. Every one of them told us that their weather has dramatically changed. Many of the regions on that continent used to plant by date because the rains came. Now they don't know when they're going to come, if they're going to come, how much it's going to be. It can be really dramatic downbursts, or it can be way short of the needs. So the suffering and the pain has shown up. It's actually one of the reasons I came back here. Because I realized there we're putting band-aids and fixing things while this country continues to drive that economic model of consumption and emission. And somehow this is what we're going to have to change and change the way we understand soil and sequestration capacities. So what's happening in agriculture too, it's really an odd thing to me because I've done some work with the International Cryosphere Climate Initiative and in the regions, and we were doing a project up in Peru where the glaciers are melting so fast that the farmers finally realize we've got to stop burning. But agricultural burning is contributing um, at least a third to the black carbon emissions. And black carbon emissions are increasing ice melts so dramatically. Uh, we think it's just global warming, but it's the black carbon deposits that are occurring and it's causing uh, actually human cause of death dramatically. Just being in Nepal, I got really sick and I even took my air mask and it wasn't this bad by any stretch. This is in Pakistan in the same region and in Delhi the same thing's happening. And they used to have three seasons of accidents in the Punjab region where they grow a lot of rice and that was during the foggy season and the rainy season. Auto accidents all the time. Now they have three seasons and that's the burning season where you can't see each other on the road and you end up in accidents. Think about those 2.5 micron particles due to your lungs or to children's lungs. And there are places on this planet now that are becoming kind of uninhabitable, both by temperature and by, in fact, air quality. And often we don't think of that so much here because we have more regulations and we're working on it. But a lot of people in this world, in China, in India, uh, in Turkey, have serious, serious uh, air quality uh, concerns based upon diesel emissions, uh, wood-burning stoves, both for cooking and heating, and then our agricultural burning, and this primarily is for either rice or wheat straw. So not only are we emitting the carbon in the air, we're taking the carbon that should be going back into the soil and being sequestered and creating fertility into the soil, uh, and we're actually diminishing the fertility, because think about a fire across the soil and all the biology our biology professors have been teaching us in the last couple of days as being damaged at the same time. But it is an agricultural practice that we ha as humans have a very, very long experience with and it's easy and they call the match um, box a magic box. It eliminates a lot of work. So what sort of brought me more and more, because I come from a very conventional farming background, very productive, um, high input, uh, and I taught at a university for a dozen years, high input, high intensive, high yield agriculture. But as I traveled the globe, I saw we were in a great decline. Well, some of these authors have been seeing that too. Now, of course, at MIT, uh, Dana Meadows began decades ago to tell us we're overreaching any chance for sustainability. And every 10 years, they put out another book and they finally said, well, we've overshot. There's no chance for sustainability. It's often why now, I don't entertain sustainability discussions. 
there's no chance. It's, we're done. We're over that opportunity. We only have one option, and that's to rebuild and regenerate. And the good news is, is it can be done. It can be done very, very rapidly. You know, uh, of course, um, Jared Diamond, in a number of his books, but Collapse, and it, it was really clear. Cultures have destroyed that which sustains their life. So as a species, we didn't pay attention too well. And I just finished Sapiens, and there's a lot of words and a little bit of content, in my opinion, but uh, he made me think about some things in ways I hadn't thought about before. And so I appreciated that. And one of the things he made me think about in a little different way is, is that there were five species of humans, most of you know this, on the planet when sapiens showed up. And when our predecessors moved into the region that those species lived, those species disappeared. Not all by axe or, you know, stone crushings of heads, but their species became eliminated and extinct. We also know as sapiens moved into this continent and as it moved into Australia and other regions of the world, huge, wonderful megafauna were eliminated. And some say, well, no, like the mammoth, they were eliminated in North America by a meteor or it was a climate change. <laughs> Problematically with those theories is that 14,000 years ago on a small island off of Alaska, there were still mammoths. And then sapiens got there. And then finally the last of that species disappeared too. So this ties back to that very earlier slide about we continue to eliminate species and life on this planet as the dominant species from the standpoint of impact here. So with storm intensifications, you would think we would become active. And of course, all those people in Houston and Miami and whatever, they are rallying on the steps of D.C. to make climate decisions for us, aren't they? They're saying, we need legislation, aren't they? Aren't we? No, we're not, are we? It's the news is over. We're past the storm season right now. Let's move on. I was, it was curious. I, you know, after all those storms went by, I called a, a dear friend in Ireland the day of the hurricane hitting Ireland. And I said, so how many of these have you experienced? He says, none. This is amazing. We have down trees and everything else. Now, do we consider how abnormal that is and how crazy our weather systems are getting? I, I, w I used to get really tired of, I, I have some, um, a brother and his family that lives in um, Minnesota saying, well, we're kind of welcoming this global warming. And I'm going, <laughs> ah. Us in California, we experienced it differently this year uh, from the standpoint of what the weather, um, climate change did. And I uh, was curious, this was a headline in a newspaper in Northern California, it says, and now nature has turned her sights on us. I don't think that's right. I think we've turned our sights on nature. And that we're now living with the result of how we have engaged the the de degradation of the systems and the balance that the systems would hold both climate in, I'm not saying weather, but climate, and the way it would hold species and the way our soils would hold life and support all of those species as well. I really had thought here in 2016, I was saying, oh good, let's see what impact this will have because if we can't say, you know, you're gonna die, at least if our coffee supplies get disrupted, <laughs> maybe somebody will want to take action. But even there, as addicted as we are to this uh, particular wonderful being, uh, doesn't seem to really get the attention. And you know what's interesting, because I've had at different uh, conferences or whatever, I've had agricultural scientists get up from renowned agricultural universities, whose names I will not mention, and say, you know, and on the West Coast it was, those of us Gee, now if I say the state, it partly gives it away. Those of us in Oregon will soon be growing those wonderful California varietals of wine as it climate warms. And I remember being on the East Coast talking and uh, someone in New York saying, and those of us up here in New York, we're gonna be growing Georgia peaches as climate warms. And I'm thinking, how insane is that? 
This is climate chaos, not global warming. Yes, the planet's getting hotter. Yes, the ice is melting. But the climate is chaotic. And what that means is, is your Georgia peach that you're growing in New York that blooms now because there's enough war earlier spring, and then that hard frost hits three weeks later and knocks all your blossoms off. Or you get ridiculous rains. Or just this year I was talking to some very conservative uh, farmers in Bakersfield area, and I said, well, how are your grapes this year? Because they had some 112 days. They said, well, we've had so many days over 100 before, but this was more than we've ever had. So a lot of the grapes didn't fill out. Some of them cooked on the vine. So this is the chaotic nature of uh, rains coming when they didn't used to come, coming much more intensely than they used to come, not coming, a heat spiking, a damaging crops. And you know plants want to shut down at certain temperatures and not produce, and so we're going to see yield losses, not yield increases with more CO2 in the atmosphere. And that's what climate will do. And my God, yes, we're going to have to have less coffee. So this young lady that I, when I came back from Africa, and she was on the central coast there near San Luis Obispo, and I said to her, you know, I can't really say I'm into tattoos, but can I take a picture of yours? I mean, gee, this is amazing. And she was working with City Farm and trying to get a relationship going between students and kids and community people on farming and agriculture. And so uh, we know what this is, right? All right, it's photosynthesis. And I said, I've never seen anybody make that kind of a commitment to this uh, process towards our life. I said, that's tremendous. She goes, well, I keep forgetting the formula. But anyway. <laughs> so, so, yeah, this reminds us, this is such a miracle. To think we take this toxin out of the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, we. This invention occurred a few years ago. I'm not, I think it's open source, too. But anyway, it's... It, 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 in essence, of course, takes what would be toxic, and this, this planet has been much higher levels of carbon dioxide in the past, but the plants with water and the chloroplast and the sunlight, of course, converts that into a carbohydrate, but it's a carbon-based, life-supporting, uh, organic molecule. So that is true in our bodies, it's of course true in plants, and it goes into the roots and it goes into all the microbiology we've been hearing about in the soil below. So how big is it? it we know it's going to have to be a leverage point because there's no technology to pull carbon dioxide out of the air, but that's a leverage point that can pull carbon dioxide out of the air. And it can pull it at levels, I'm going to show you in just a minute, that are remarkable. And we haven't been really looking at that as our way out of this predicament very seriously. So what this green bar is talking to us about here is, is to say that this is to really kind of get back to that 350 marker, which you know I don't agree with, um, but without kind of taking our carbon um, photosynthetic potential, we're going to stay on that upper line and not get to where we need to be in time. So we do need to use our plants and our soils to really make this thing happen. So when Howard Buffett had come um, to meet the work we were doing at Rodale, he wanted to learn about roller crimpers, and he became a little too obsessed with them, and he started to have different ones made. I put him in touch with somebody in Pennsylvania to make them, and this was a great 30-foot one that we were, I got to play with in Africa, and I ran onto Penn State's research plot, because this was their research plot in uh, Africa. I said, gee, can I roll down your, actually, None of these universities there were planting cover crops until they come and see my no input cover crop system and they go, oh, and Howard kind of likes that, doesn't he? So they'd run out and plant cover crops too in their research plots. I said, can I roll your, your thing down? I just want to see how this babala, which is what it was called, how it would work as a, as a great, uh, you know, protection, as Ray would say, armor, um, carbon, re-input into the soil. And I was just hoping they weren't going to go plow it, which of course they did anyway. Um, but I was, got to use some, some of this equipment and see how it worked on different crops, which was really fun. But in essence, um, this is the one Howard gave me um, because he wanted me to work with the um, oxen for smallholder farmers. And in essence, in setting up some uh, experiments and some trials, um, this system worked just as well. 
the problem was when I used these oxen, because, you know, I'm an old dairyman, so I know cattle, but I've never used oxen before. And what I learned is, is that the GPS works great on the tractors, but it doesn't work so well on the oxen, and I couldn't always get straight lines with them. But um, they, they get distracted. I don't understand it. <laughs> this is my home in California, and um, I, had, I plant cover crops there, and actually that parcel I don't really farm. I'm planting some walnuts in there for dry farm organic walnuts, but uh, in essence, uh, it can grow very robustly. We can get a lot of biomass. This puts away a tremendous amount of carbon, and it's building my soil. Now, when the summer's coming and it goes dry, this would be quite a fire hazard. So I had a, uh, and I roll it down before it gets to be summer. And this roller, this very expensive roller, um, I saw sitting in my neighbor's yard that he, it was uh, old uh, water heaters welded together with uh, concrete put in the center, you know, poured in the center. And he used it to pack his horse arena. So I said, can I borrow that, please? And so it worked perfectly on rolling down my, this was about seven species cover crop uh, to get the biodiversity in the system, and it rolled down nicely. But before I rolled it down, I had um, some neighbors, they, they would walk every day this loop of a couple miles, and they were coming across, and I was out knocking some weeds down in front of my property, and they said, boy, we thought we had a weed problem, you really do. <laughs> and I tried to explain to them what each species could do for the field and what I was doing with it. And they looked at me very suspiciously because fire hazards, you know, are a, a concern. And to them, they saw me as a risk. Um, and while I'm talking to them, a dad and a son are riding by on their bicycles. And this little 10-year-old boy says, boy, dad, you wouldn't let your weeds get that big, would you? <laughs> so we live in a world of peer pressure. I still do this. The people look at me rolling that thing down and not harvesting it and feeding it to somebody's horses, and they know I'm crazy. So, it's, you know, it's like they cannot figure this out. But in essence, it's part of what Dee Dee Peerhouse talks about, and some of us have been working in how do we get adopters to adopt and change is that peer pressure matters, and we need to create support systems. Ray and I were talking about this a lot last night. We need to create support systems so farmers that do make a shift are supported somehow by others so that they can hold on to it. I'll tell you a story. Aaron Stevens at uh, uh, Nature's Path had told me a story about um, they had a large grain farmer that was in his almost his third year of transition into getting to be organic grain grower. And as that farmer pulls into the coffee shop, his neighbor farmer said, boy, we saw those weeds out in your field. And he quit right there because peer pressure and you can't you know get too far out of your group or you get ostracized a little bit so we as humans have this tendency uh, to fall into a normalization that's not helpful to us fixing this problem is it and that's part of where the third part of this uh, presentation today will go into so we have uh, these what I call these are sort of my heroes on trying to shift paradigm away from input consciousness to biological life. And so these, these people have been out there and they're educating and now they're getting into so many speaking series, but we still have universities teaching the old systems. You know, the soils class I took in the 60s in uh, university is the same soils class my father took in the 30s in the university. You know, and that soil there could hold the root and then you bring the nutrients to it, you know? And these crazy folk are up here trying to tell us we don't need to do that. Well, my experiment in Africa showed me I didn't need to do that. As a matter of fact, I learned more there in the experimentation and I kind of asked Howard, I said, Howard, you love the results of what we're getting here. You're very, you're very thrilled with what, where we're going with this. But I said, I'd like to understand more. Can't we bring a soil biologist in here, can't we? And he didn't, he didn't want to spend that money. Anyway, priorities, I guess. But the point is, is to say, in a way, I'm kind of happy because the biologists I brought, I don't think would have taught me what I, what I needed to learn from. And these four, I think, are really talking to us very, very deeply about how interconnected and intertwined this biological process and life of the soil is. And one of the things we knew when I was at Rodale is there was a correlation to carbon sequestration 
and mycorrhizal fungi. And I think we're understanding what's going on there now to understand why that's really crucial. So David Johnson, who was in that picture, is one of the people I met when I came back. And he's one of the most remarkable soil biologists because, and this is what I love about his research, is that he is in the College of Engineering. He is a um, micromolecular biologist. And he was given the challenge of getting rid of dairy farm waste in Las Cruces, New Mexico. So there had been a 10-year project going on, and what happened with the compost is the salinity was building up in the soil. So as you just take that manure, compost it, apply it, the salinity was building up. So what David did is that he took the compost and creatively turned it into a aerobic compost pile. And instead of an anaerobic basis where, like with the lane slides where you're turning it and you're getting the heat up there and you have the water and you have the seepage, this was aerobic and there was no seepage and there's no odor. And it uh, will get to some temperatures, but you don't, have, you don't ever turn it and leave it, let it stand for a year. And you're sure that you have air going through this compost. Not by fans, just you can put pipes in. I made my own. And it's like you would get leach line pipes, drill extra holes, stand them up, and pile your compost in your bin. And it works perfect. Well, after one year of treatment in this cotton field versus 150 pounds of knives, one of the things that he noticed really rapidly is, is that this compost was fungal dominant. And that's a little bit, if you were just in Elaine's discussion, she was talking about the needs of, of fungal communities in much of our crop. This year, uh, David is now putting this in a slide. He sent me this picture of his cotton. When I was in high school, that was one of my FFA projects was growing cotton. And, you know, I used to say, hey, my cotton's knee high. You know, every once in a while I'd get never really quite hip high. But that was good cotton. This is about six foot high. And he just sent me a picture email last night, which I didn't have time to put it in here, that he's picking it now. And the bull set, it's not just rank growth, the bull set's tremendous. He's getting well over double the yields of the commercial cotton farmers in Las Cruces with just this inoculant. How much compost does he apply? Well, agricultural rates would say six to 10 tons per acre. That's input consciousness. That's saying I'm bringing the nitrogen, I'm bringing the other nutrients to the plant. He's applying less than 400 pounds because he's dealing from the consciousness of inoculation, not bringing the nutrients, letting the biology develop the nutrients. So this is a tremendous shift in a paradigm. The fertilizer companies are thrilled. <laughs> or maybe not. So it's tough. I just want to say it's tough to get funding for this research. David is struggling for funding. The other uh, scientist that's doing this kind of powerful work on rangelands is Dr. Richard Teague at uh, Texas A&M, struggling for funding. There's not support in the universities for this kind of research. And we don't, so many of those researchers have to go out and find private funding. Well, where do you go to? Usually big businesses. And I understand that Monsanto's involved in 74 of the 77 agricultural colleges in this country. It's tough to get biological funding to produce a product that's basically free. So here's in, in 19, I mean in 2007, um, they asked me to come and interview at Ro Rodale Institute for the CEO position and I went and I said to my wife, I said, I'm not going if they're not interested in what I've seen that I've got to work in the rest of my life. And I said, that's hunger. It's water and climate. And I said, if they're not interested, uh, I'm not going to go. Well, Artie Rodale was still alive then. She was very interested about issues internationally. She was very interested. Um, and one scientist there said, well, if that's your interest, have we got some numbers for you? And I sat down with him, and the carbon numbers were there, that we could impact those three things very, very rapidly. Uh, with looking at building soil carbon. So you know you can improve water cycle. You know you can improve uh, productivity and start to feed people. We know, we've seen the data, if you've been here in some of these presentations, it's very true. Most of the food in the world is produced by smallholder farmers. 
not by U.S. And we know, therefore, we can take care of this hunger issue, and we know we can pull the amount of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere that we need to, to correct the situation. So what we based our work on was no tilling, winter cover crops, and compost, these three. And the compost data was a research project that was done at Rodale, but it was done by USDA. And that was 2,300 kilograms of carbon sequestered on average per year when it was applied three times in 10 years. So we're building soil carbon levels pretty rapidly with that. Based upon that information, based upon looking at the number of acres, if we started to move, bring in cover crops and start to move towards no-till, we had a chance combining, changing the way we practice grazing to more of a multi-paddock grazing, mob grazing, plan grazing, holistic management, whatever term you want to use, system, that we could sequester it all if you did the back of the envelope calculations. Now we know it takes water to make carbon. Remember photosynthesis? You have to have the water. So if we go to a huge global drought, we're not going to be sequestering much carbon. But when we increase our efficiencies, when we cover our soil and don't lose our water, when we get the right rains or irrigation, we could sequester all of it. When I came back from Africa, there was an interesting study that came out of Georgia, University of Georgia, that said we could actually sequester eight tons of carbon per acre if we take those bad Georgian soils that have been degraded and take them out of row crop and put them into grazing pasture, permanent pasture. And in essence, the mycorrhizae get busy and the plant grazing uh, helps challenge the system appropriately and you can build a robust soil very rapidly back. If Thomas Jefferson and George Washington had known that, we wouldn't have had the great westward movement. Maybe we wouldn't have 40 million people in California now. You guys would still have some of them. But anyway, um, that was an amazing level. Now, they, they used fertilizer in that in situation, and it plateaued after about six to eight years. So it grew that level constantly, and then it quit. So that's one of the challenges we have in soil carbon sequestration as an excuse for not stopping our emissions. Because eventually soils will plateau unless you really stack practices and get very creative, but then eventually there is a capacity and then you will not be sequestering more carbon. So having said that still, Richard Teague at Texas A&M is showing at least one to three tons of carbon per hectare per year being sequestered. It's a little harder in the brittle and dry environments to get to that level, but where you have rainfall uh, and summer growth, uh, you can get to that level pretty consistently with properly managed lands. Now there's a lot of other data points, but this last one is um, taking David Johnson's data points, and this is very exciting. Because in that soil inoculation and getting the biology right, getting the biology really working well, we can sequester, as you see up here, uh, over 16,000 kilograms. So what we're having is a situation where we can, and David did some calculations, and I'm not going to be as robust as he is, but I would say that if we only use 50% of the farmland around the world with that level, we would sequester all that we're emitting. That's only 50%. It gives us a chance to draw down. It would give us a chance literally to come back to pre-industrial levels. And that's one of the most exciting pieces of knowledge that's out there. And I will tell you, David Johnson is having trouble getting published. The last time he told me he had three of the peer-reviewed scientists sign off on his data, and the fourth one said, I don't understand it. Wouldn't sign off. I mention that because these, when we change paradigms, our institutions and the training and the thought processes and the history and our credentials get in the way of being able to see the new paradigm and where it might be going. And also, there are pressures that we don't make those changes based upon other special interests. So here's Gabe Brown, who's been talked about a couple of times by a couple of speakers. And, uh, whoops, and David uh, developed this slide by taking Gabe Brown's data points. So Gabe started out, and if you listen to his story, you know he, was, he had uh, uh, crop disasters, 
and was going to go broke, and it forced him into change. And it's sort of like, as a young man was saying here earlier today, until your back's against the wall, you don't really change. And so his back was against the wall, and he went into a no-till environment, and his soil started to improve in the amount of carbon. He started to improve his crop diversity through rotations, and it continued on a climb upward, and he began to be able to profitably grow crops. What he also found as he started then to grow cover crops is it got better, and he began to have less and less need for expenses of fertilizers. So what Gabe loves to say, and to me it's the greatest communication point from farmer to farmer, is his greatest line is, and I'm sure you've heard it, but it is, I like to sign the back of the check, not the front of the check. And that, of course, helps farmers go, okay, I'll listen to that one. Um, but if you come in and talk organic or something like that, forget it. So that's the good thing. But what happens here is he began to plant multi-species cover crops, and the, the, it starts to go curve linear on us. There starts to be a jump in the amount of carbon that's starting to be sequestered in the soil because the multi-species complexity is bringing in a healthier biome in the soil and we're getting more carbon sequestered at that point. And then when he brings the livestock into graze is when it really takes off. And what is he getting? 22.63 tons of carbon per hectare per year. So we can discredit scientists in saying, oh, that's just in the research plots. But of course, scientists like to discredit farmers because that's just a testimonial. But what I love is take the work David Johnson's showing biologically what's going on in his research, and then here's a farm that's actually the same thing's happening. And so it's sort of reality tests. It doesn't happen just in the field plots at the University of New Mexico. So these are very, very encouraging numbers, and it's a knowledge base we get to live with today to give us real hope that we could take this carbon dioxide level back down very, very fast. Uh, as we know, at the same time, we're going to build a water cycle capacity in the soil. We're going to improve the fertility of the soil. We're going to reduce the amount of chemicals dramatically that are going into our, our ecosystems, take them out of our waterways because they won't be draining and, and, and making dead zones around the world. So building that soil carbon, using that photosynthesis, and as David would say, improving the efficiency of the photosynthesis. And we didn't know that could happen. Because a lot of people, when I used to give talks on we could sequester it all, they would push back and go, no, you just pile that leaf matter and all on top of the soil, and it all is going to break down, and the CO2 is going to go back in the air, and it's just an equilibrium. It's actually not fact. David has shown that as that soil gets healthier, the efficiency improves, and less is respired. Less, the plant then has to feed the system less and can put more into its own biomass and its own yield. And so everything improves in that system. Carbon, more carbon being sequestered, more yield coming out, a better soil structure, and of course, better water percolation, all when we begin to invest in these whole systems of no-till, cover cropping, biological enhancement, if, if we're going to bring the inoculants in. And he doesn't re-inoculate every year. He kind of gets it started, and we should be good to go, as long as we keep a root in the ground. And that's an important element. So having soil that's not growing anything, what's the biology going to do? So it's important to keep the root in the ground and keep the whole system moving forward. So one of the things that I've worked in in leadership development, I've worked in and think in terms of how do we shift human consciousness you know, we have the knowledge. We have some people showing it. Gabe Brown's showing it. Other farmers, Gail Fuller showing it. D.D. Peerhouse is teaching a bunch of people in Vermont. Why, how fast is this changing? Because if we look at the diffusion of innovation and we study these models and think about how fast we can shift to a transition to a new technology, to a new way of being, it shouldn't take that long. We know the innovators are the ones who are creative. They'll risk it. The early adopters will watch them, and then they'll come in and they'll, they'll, you know, imitate and do the same thing. We know that the laggards will die and go to their grave and never change, all right? And may they rest in peace. We, we need them to move. <laughs> but coming out of the organic world, 
How have we succeeded in this adoption? We're working on it. Well, we are for 93 years. <laughs> Well, see, I love this because I do every day too. I work on it. But when I look at 93 years when Rudolf Steiner came out and told us, you know, about soil and soil health and biology, et cetera, and the organic movement started, I don't call it a movement anymore because we have 0.6% of the land converted to organic in this country, 0.9% globally. And we need to fix this now. So the beauty is if we sort of go to work with all the farmers, we can start to transition a whole bunch of land, not 1%, less than 1%, a whole bunch of land to not using all those chemicals. And it starts to get us where we need, know we need to go anyway. When I put these papers out, the one on we could sequester it all, used regenerative organic farming. And when we looked at the Green Revolution, we knew we could, we could produce it in organic systems and this criticism we're getting organic couldn't feed the world, we knew it was false. So we put these papers out, we had the data, we had the research. You know the only difference I would do today on those papers, although I could change numbers in, in them now with new data, is I'd drop the word organic. Because it's a barrier to most conversations. It's a fighting point with most companies. It's a way not to get in the door and begin to make the transition. Will I stop growing organic? No. Will I stop eating organic? No. I believe deeply in it. But I just wouldn't use the word anymore. Because we need everybody. We need to reach out and meet them where they are and bring them our direction as fast as we can. Uh, and that's really the only chance that we have. So we have, Ray was here, Gabe wasn't here. We have these kind of guys that can talk their kind of language. And they can say it boldly to the kinds of farmers that actually resent the heck out of us in the organic world or don't like it or think that's the left coast or, you know, you guys on the east coast and these coastal liberals, um, what well, your kind of thing, but that's not us. And we need to be able to overcome that because that corn and soybean part of the world needs to have regenerated soils for all of our sakes, for every one of us. And so we need to open, and these guys do a tremendous job and their classes are selling out very, very well. At Chico State, we've started. I've been helping and giving some time up there. It's a six-hour drive, so it's not easy, but up there. We're starting a center for regenerative agriculture, and it's a unique opportunity because most universities, the dean of agriculture could not withstand the development of a center for regenerative agriculture because the, the funding pressures, the institutional embeddedness in old systems, in GMOs or in fertilizers or in pesticides would not permit it. So we have a very unique opportunity with Dr. Cindy Daly there, who's pictured that she started an organic dairy farm up there 10 years ago, only because the university dairy was going broke and she went and researched systems. She, like me, was raised in the conventional system, did a lot of studying and turned into a pasture-based organic dairy, seasonal even. And now it's a profit center on the university farm. But we're moving into this regenerative discussion away from the organic. You should have seen the industry pressure she received by doing that. And we want to be able to reach all the farmers in that neighborhood and make it actually an international center. But what's beautiful is we found a way to structure it under the sustainability, the Center for Sustainability on campus, who reports to the provost. So no dean can directly influence this work. And now we've attracted the attention of the university president. And the university president, she sat down with Cindy and I, and she said, this is so exciting. I want to make it my legacy. She goes, it's my number one priority on campus. So we actually have a university with a president with now a, a, a place to live that we now, just with proper funding, can not only do the research, educate and develop a curriculum for students, train farmers, have a demonstration site, and now we've been challenged to create a journal for regenerative agriculture where people like David Johnson can find a home to publish in peer-reviewed work. So, it's a challenge. Thank you.
All it takes is a little bit of money, but we're getting some started and we're going to keep working on it. But this is a hopeful piece from the standpoint that we need a home for this new world of biology, sequestration, and feeding the world's hungry. Roland Bunch is this hero of mine that showed me in the 80s in Honduras that uh, he said, look, we can build topsoils an inch a year. He said, there's not a textbook in the world that says you can do that. And uh, that's true. There still isn't. You know, it was about five years ago, we were both in Zambia at, a, at an African conference presenting, and he said, Tim, you know when I told you in Honduras I could build an inch of soil a year? He said, oh yeah, I remember that, Roland. I've been telling everybody around the world. What are you going to tell me now? He says, I was lying to you. I go, shoot. Because, yeah, we were doing a lot more than that, but I knew you wouldn't believe me. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was. And in tropical environments, that was possible. And he knew systems and ways to regenerate and build soil tremendously fast. What he didn't know about, what we weren't tracking, was carbon sequestration. And he wishes to heck he had that data. It would knock all of our socks off, I know right now. Kofi Boa, who uh, uh, David Montgomery wrote about one whole chapter in his last book about Kofi in Ghana, that I said well, was helping him set up some of experimental plots, uh, is doing the same kind of level in tropical systems. And so these two have gotten to know each other, and we've been in communication together, trying to figure out how we help take this more rapidly, because both Roland and Kofi have each been educating tens of thousands of smallholder farmers. But we have millions that we need to somehow figure out how we're going to get educated into these systems. Um, this is my cornfield, actually, in South Africa, when I had Kofi there to do some teaching. And uh, he's wearing a hat that says LaSalle on it. I just want to say it's, it's really neat to... Uh, have a university that shares your name and they sell apparel, you know, so it's kind of... <laughs> so what happens is that we know, and I've known just by logic, by being a sort of a practical farmer, saying, you know, we need to stack our practices. So if we want to maximize our carbon capture, let's start to stack them. And, and that means, of course, no tilling. We've got to figure out how to do that in our vegetable systems better. Elaine was just talking about just strip till. Strip till is a start. That really is. Uh, putting cover crops in, multi-species cover crops we know is much better. Uh, compost, if you have it or can get it, that's always good because it's more stable carbon. It's going to go back into that system. Plant diversity, mob grazing, and biological inoculation, as David Johnson is kind of teaching us right now, can really bolster systems, sequester carbon, and capture it. That's what I term regenerative agriculture. We can build soils over an inch a year, in, in where there's enough moisture, amazing. That turns from any conversation of sustainability, throws that in the garbage bin which, where it belongs, and takes us to a future of potential. Um, here was some corn where I planted a, a macuna bean interspaced that was a bush macuna. Now Kofi's spreading that throughout Ghana. Most macuna is a climbing vine. But here, where you had you know, open space between your corn, that's just opportunity for weeds to grow. So grow something that's going to give you nitrogen, give you biomass, and be building your soil at the same time you're growing the crop, and using full photosynthesis space on, on every square inch of land. Can we feed the planet on 50% of the land? You know, everybody's saying, we need more land. We've got to clear forests. We have to um, get more GMOs and fertilizers out there because we just don't have enough land. Well, my experience was we don't need all the land in farming. And Raton Lyle, recently I was talking with him at Ohio State, he made that this statement, and I concur. We could feed these seven, eight, nine, ten billion people on half the land. Just look at the yield differences that David's showing. Look at the yield differences that well, I got to experience in Africa. So that's such a bright future. That means we stop cutting forests. You know? That means we stop kind of taking new terrain, and it begins to be able to take care of human needs. We can do this with this technology of life, biology, systems, non-reductionistic approaches to being able to restore systems and rebuild them. So. I have gotten deeply into the uh, first two parts of this, and now I'm going to ask us to go to a second part. 
So we said we know we're on the trajectory of extinction, and there's no data point that says we've turned that corner. We know we have the solutions, and we just reviewed a whole bunch of them here. And it all comes back basically to earth, to soil, uh, to the life supporting system. So why aren't we acting? And this is the place I'm going to go out maybe into some new territory with you today. Why aren't we as this human species that's created so much extinction acting? A friend of mine actually was a professor of mine because my actual last degree uh, is in depth psychology. That's why I'm here talking to you about soil, right? But the reason it is is because what I saw in the world said we weren't going to make this change. And behavior is not what has gotten us to make any big changes. Behavior changes. There's so many pressures and forces out there that push our behavior and pull us into what's attractive that it's probably, we don't have the political will, the social will, the human heart compassionate will to make these changes, uh, probably not going to work. I was sitting with Robert Sardello, who had been a professor, but he's become a friend. We were just with him in New Mexico this last week. He was over for dinner, and he's written many books. I just put a few of them up there. But he said, so what are you up to? And I told him about the, some of the soil and this carbon and you know, and economic restructuring because our economic design is just destructive. And I said, we can do this and this and this. He said, hey, that's good thinking, really good. It won't work. I said, well, you can leave now. No. Um, <laughs> why? So his, his point is valid. It won't work because humans are involved and the human psyche. And so the human psyche and our psychologies and how we operate really is disconnected from ecology. James Hellman, who passed away recently, said psychology is quite irrelevant to the anguish affecting great consensus. Even that anguish and those dilemmas are internalized into personal psychological problems. And we're such a me, me society and focused. He says to be resolved apart from their source in an ugly, unjust, unhealthy world. This is the only important question for psychology today. What bearing has psychology on the environment? And can psychology become ecologically effective? Do you know even the study or the discipline of eco-psychology has gotten to be extractive and exploitive? Because so much eco-psychology is go out into nature and heal yourself. And I watch people run up and hug a tree and go, oh, it gave me so much. Yeah, what did we do for the tree? Did we ever think about that? Can we go out and heal that? And you know what? If we turn our focus into healing this, be amazed what it does to our own psychology and a little bit of what Hellman was taking us to. I've respected and known James uh, Hollis for a while, and he says, what we resist in time becomes pathology, either through platitudinous, superficial lives or embodied as addictions, depressions, or obsessions with those objects upon which the unlived life has been projected. We may confess instead that what we resist will persist as a haunting. Well, we know where we find ourselves in this country on addictions. It's, it is really a huge, huge problem. A lot of it is our disassociation, our nature deficit disorder. But I want to say just a little bit about haunting, because I live with hauntings. And the hauntings that I live with is to know that my actions and my lifestyle impact my brothers and sisters in the world of all species, but certainly in the human capacity, we are in a, a very powerful destructive mode that we talked about a little bit earlier. And psychologically, how do we deal with that, knowing that my actions are causing pain, suffering, and death at times? And I want to say that problematically in behavioral psychology or cognitive awareness or whatever, it's not going to get to the root of this problem. And this is where depth in my perspective and my experience had to come into question. So often we kind of design, we create a design of, of the human psyche as that the soul or the psyche lives inside of us. And, you know, all the philosophers try to say, well, where is the soul? Where can we find it in the human? But, you know, in actuality, that unconscious realm, and we can prove this through, and I won't go into it right now, through many kinds of experiments and trials and show you that our awareness exists beyond our body. It's at, so we, our, our ego, our consciousness lives inside actually this unconscious realm, this solar psyche. And it's bigger than this, 
or our thinking or this physical body. And what's really, I think, important for us to think about as we're trying to fix the planet and change our behavior is that most of our decisions are made in un by the unconscious a split second before the conscious mind. And when Jung and Freud came to America in 1909 at Clark University, the American psychologists got this. And they started a business called advertising. And Jung and Freud went home very disappointed. That's not what they were trying to share. But they understood how you could profit from this. The reason I have a cobra snake up here is to just affirm something in this. So in Africa, one night, being the age I am and um, a prostate that's larger than one would want, I got up to pee. And I walked into the bathroom, didn't turn the lights on, didn't want to wake my wife up, and I barefootedly stepped on a snake. In Africa, that could mean death because most of them are poisonous. And we were an hour out of a town, uh, two hours out of a major hospital, and you couldn't keep anti-venom because there were two different kinds of venom, and if you gave the wrong one, you were toast. And some of them, you had no chance anyway. And you didn't know what you stepped on, but the likelihood was, oh, shit. I was in the bathtub in a long leap before I had a chance to think about anything. My body reacted to a snake under your foot, you know, wiggling, barefoot, and I was into that bathtub. That wasn't conscious mind. That wasn't my brilliance. That wasn't my brain is thinking through this. Thinking through it, hmm, I just stepped on a very poisonous snake. What should I do? You know, no time. But unconsciously, I was able to avoid getting bitten somehow. Um, so I don't know how, uh, but I got in the bathtub and then I told my wife, I said, now please uh, turn to the bathroom. And I go, what are you doing? Back up. And we couldn't see it. It had gotten behind the sink. And uh, as I saw, it was about that big around. And so I just closed the bathroom door. said, so we'll deal with it when I go to the farm meeting in the morning and get it out of there. But this is just the example I wanted to give to say that we make our decisions unconsciously usually and only consciously occasionally. And the other problem is that our society, our culture, what we're creating is and what our psychology tries to do is bring people back to be normal. Problematically, normal is pathological. Didn't I just say we're headed to extinction in our normal way of living? Get up, drive to work, buy, 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 Support your kids this way, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It is destructive. So denial is one of the ways that we use as humans to defend against things that are too difficult. And it's important for us psychologically. Problematically, we're in a space of where it's really dangerous with regard to climate change and soil loss. So psychology begotten by a way of life that is fundamentally unmanageable and unsustainable. Its bedrock is the opposite of solid. Chronic uncertainty, chronic uncertainty begets anxiety, and then to mask the attendant afflictions, the nightmares, and the terror, there is denial. Chellis is a, an interesting person and an author. That's another story. But I sat down with somebody yesterday at lunch who started talking to me about this, not knowing if I was just a farmer or whatever, but he was talking about his anxiety, talking about knowing the reality, talking about not knowing what to do, talking about, I don't think, what am I going to do for my kids? And that lives with us either consciously or unconsciously right now. And part of the pathology that's coming forward is the ability to deny but repress and not deal with. The pathology of normal also is psychic numbing. And Lifton wrote the book about Nazi doctors. How could someone work in the, in the uh, termination extinction camps the, in the Holocaust and go home to their family at night and have a dinner and love their children and pet their dog. That is absolutely an ability to dissociate, divide, and to numb from what we're doing. And this is a psychological strategy we're using, mostly unconsciously, to avoid the very, very hard discussion in our own selves of our actions and what we're doing as a species to the planet and our future. I would argue that the lack of feminine 
basically from everything in our myths to our societal structure is another part of this challenge. And I don't mean, um, this is a depth term, I don't mean necessarily women, but I mean a, a, we need a vision of what our human experience could encompass if liberated from this need to dominate and control. And that's what our culture, our economy, our politics, our aspirations lack. It lacks this feminine capacity um, to be able to begin to embrace, include, and uh, not dominate and control. The cultural complex that we are immersed in is we are stewards or masters or conquerors, but nothing ever truly satisfies our vast and restless longings, and advertising promises to satiate that for you. And I tell you, I got my eye on a sports car, but if I buy it, not only will I not fit in it, <laughs> it will lose its luster very fast as it sits in my garage. It will damage the planet. And I will then have to look for the next thing that might fulfill this need. And I will not ever find it in the outer external material world, but our culture promises that. My wife and I got rid of our TV 20 years ago. Not specifically because of that, but it's sure nice not to be watching those advertisements. I don't have time to go into a lot of these other pieces, but in essence, there is a discussion on a psychology of liberation, and one of the liberation parts we need is the colonizing of our mindset and our consciousness and our unconscious. And that colonizing has gone on from the time we were socialized very young on up. Um, Pablo Ferrer wrote a lot about this in Brazil, uh, particularly with uh, people in poverty and trying to help liberate them out. You cannot be oppressed if you realize you are being and you refuse to be. It takes an oppressor and an oppressed to make that system work. If the oppressed no longer has an oppressor, that's a kind of a problem in that dynamic too. But we have to start inside of ourselves and our own psyche to step out of that. We do have a Thanatos drive that we have to admit, and that is one towards death. There is a drive towards life, and there's a drive towards death in us. And this is on a collective level right now. We need to bring that to a level of awareness and begin to embrace that understanding. Don't embrace the action, embrace the understanding. Loss of sacred and a failure of eco-psychology. So these are offerings that, in some writing that I have done, that I want to at least offer something to say I think there's a way out of this as a species. It's going to take, I think, some real, real reflective work and some work uh, sometimes that has some risk to it. No, actually, all the time it has risk to it. But first, we need enough ego strength to suffer marginalization and individuation. And I would say most of you in here already have that. You're already marginalized, probably, because you're at this weird bio-nutrient <laughs> conference sitting on the fringe of the fringe trying to make a huge change in the world. And you need enough ego strength to be able to do that and not stay in the, when Dee Dee talks about the farmer that goes to the coffee shop, not stay in the peer pressure. Or you have to change your peers, don't you? But the problem is, those peers we want to change to us. And we have to figure out ways to do that. But we're going to be, we've got to find who we are, where our values really are, where our commitments really lie, and have enough ego strength to move forward from that. Two is, we need an initiation into the dream of the end of the world. People often ask if I have hope, and I say, no, I don't. And that's a good thing. Hope is a placeholder for action. We actually have to act. We can't say, oh, well, I hope the president fixes it, or I hope the, you know, these guys do it, or I hope that happens, or I hope Ray Archuleta teaches all the farmers, or, you know, I hope these biologists, you know, get their word out. No, we actually have to act. But we have to accept, in essence, and what uh, I had a dream during um, some of my work in this realm of where I was in a room, and there was a, this was before the real snake, there was a snake in the stream, and I knew it was poisonous, and I was getting out, and I had a thought, a dream thought, my dream ego had this thought, Wait, I think I need to be bit. 
I need the, I think it's like an initiation. I need to be initiated. And I was working with some people at the time who had understood we are at the edge of the cliff and we're probably going over. And they were understanding that, yes, I have children and they probably don't have a very bright future. They were in living in the apocalyptic dream, understanding. And I think we have to be there. We can't deny it. That I say is denial. Once we're there, it frees us up from illusion and it gives us an opportunity to act and act now. And I would offer that as a positive, not a negative. I know it feels a little tough, but I would argue it's a very important piece to be with. And then thirdly, is we do need to return to the sacred or reverential because in fact this domination idea and the way we've translated our scriptures has left us in the thought process that this species, it was all made for us to just use. And that has created where we find ourselves a real problem. I don't think it's here for us to use at all, but I think if we really respond to creation and the magnificence of what creation is, it's to be in this relationship and to learn from it and to give to it. And that that new myth, that's very old myth among many cultures, but not the Western culture, is one that I think could bring us very rapidly back into an opportunity to build and regenerate and create a future for us. That's a big order, but I ask you and all of you, what are you looking, what do you see? This is my last slide, and it's the question I want to leave you with. What are our individual actions, and how do we help make the transformation that we need to make not just externally, reflectively also internally, so that we can act from a very grounded space from a space that really is centered on Earth and each other, and that comes from compassion for everybody on the planet, all species, all life forms. And I think that until we get there, we remain extractive and destructive, we remain opportunistic and exploitive. I was just listening to NPR last night at four in the morning, and they were talking about, we're going back to the moon. We can mine stuff up there that we need for here. thought we could do a whole presentation just on that. <laughs> wow. Thank you very much. <laughs>